Hey guys, welcome to No Tux Allowed, that show where penguins are apparently not allowed, but sometimes they still show up every now and then. And, uh, th there's not a whole lot of penguin discussion today. But, uh, Big Pod, I'm gonna need you to Google that for me. <laughs> yeah. Don't you mean uh, Bing it? <laughs> oh, Bing it? Uh, oh, I wouldn't know. Oh, uh, I guess I should probably introduce myself. I'm Josh, by the way. I'm a host, and then this guy next to me here, he is Big Pod, who is the guy that claims to be smarter than me. <laughs> uh, and I'm not sure if it's me that claims that, but everybody else. Well, everybody says that I'm some kind of a genius, and you're the one correcting me all the time, so you must be smarter. <laughs> 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 but... Anyways, uh, Big Pod, uh, I know I just uh, joked about you go googling something, uh, and that's po probably because uh, you you have used Google, not because you have decided to use Google, but because it was already there. Yeah. Yes, and uh, obviously, if you've been watching the technology news, you already know that we're we're a week behind on reporting this at the very least, probably two weeks, maybe three. Weeks. Uh, I don't really know, but. Uh, just five days ago, a, a, a judge in federal court in the United States has declared that Google is a monopoly. Uh, and this is uh, verified under the Sherman Act of the United States of America. Yep. And uh, this specifically applies towards Google search. Yeah. And... Uh, I have been skimming the 286-page rule, ruling provided to us through Reuters. The, and basically, it is, a whole, whole lot of opinion. Yes. But what Google violated was Section 2 of Sherman Act. So, the Section 2, that's important because there are many sections of the Sherman Act, at least as far as I hear. Uh, at yes. least, at uh, least there is at least w one more the section one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, at least one more. Uh, I haven't read the Sherman Act myself. All I know is that it's a very old document, and there's yeah. probably a PDF of it somewhere. And if you go to Google the Sherman Act, uh, you instead just get the antitrust law, which, which is exactly what, what the Sherman is. Act is. Yeah, pretty much. That's what but, I you know, you know can't... it for. Yeah, but anyways, uh, big pod, uh. The there have been a couple of mentions specifically on what Google has been doing. Yeah. Uh, obviously, we've got uh, the search deals. Uh, you know, uh, Google paying companies to make sure that Google is the default search engine. Yeah. Among now, those this is Mozilla for Firefox and Apple, and of course, having a deal with basically every everyone who does Android, allegedly. Yeah, now, this inherently, deals like this are not an issue. But yeah. some actually of the stipulations... Is, you, you act, Google actually is the best. Problem is that not everybody considers that. That's when it becomes a problem. Well, uh, what the real problem is, is when Google pays enough money that, that they can tell you that, hey, don't even bother making a search engine. Also that. We got you covered. Yeah, also that. And uh, I've been re reading the details on some of these search agreements here. And uh, it gets pretty nasty. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but I also learned some fun facts. Because, uh, you know, there was a period of time... Where Mozilla Firefox changed from Google to Yahoo. Really? Yeah. Much uh, so, before me. Uh, yeah. Uh, so the default search engine for Firefox was Google basically forever. But between 2014 and 2017, Yahoo, uh, that that wonderful company, uh, decided that they were going to spend a lot of money on Mozilla and become the default search engine. This was basically Yahoo's last final attempt at, on being a relevant standalone company, if I remember right. So, not before me, but after I already stopped using Firefox. Yeah. And, uh, 
there was an interesting statistic that came out where something like 65% of the people changed the default search engine away from Yahoo with 26% of them changing back to Google and the rest going to others. Huh. Now, uh, if you've ever changed a search engine in Firefox, you'll find that it's actually inherently easier compared to Chrome. Yeah. Which uh, is also, I don't think that part bit is mentioned, but uh, that's just from my own personal experience. Also, a lot of times you can just click on the bar and then click on a button and uh, you can just uh, go straight to that search. But uh, I don't do a whole lot of clicking on the browser. I just type into the URL bar. Same. Yep. And uh, there, there's a couple hits on uh, Google's ad business as well. But uh, where Google is monopolizing basically everything off of that, Google search engine uh, makes money by selling digital advertisements. Uh, the word running shoes in a general search engine uh, will... Sh yeah, okay, yeah. That's just a explanation as to how their ad business works. But yeah, it is a... total market capitalization of more than $2 trillion. Wow, they're not a small company. Yeah, they are. Uh, so what you're saying is that Google is approximately one t one tenth of the U.S. Uh, <laughs> U.S. national debt. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I oh, don't have wow. mu much to say about this since I've been dealing with another topic last few days and reading about so this is mostly josh yeah we're gonna we're gonna get to that one a bit later yeah uh that one's gonna be spicy so anyways with uh with with this landmark ruling uh now we get to play the the uh wonderful game of prediction called uh what happens next because the yeah. last time a company was struck down by the sherman act was this kind of not this kind of large company we're yeah, talking about was yeah we're not talking about Microsoft because Microsoft settled yeah. they didn't they didn't reach a ruling on that one yeah and it but, still had a huge problems yeah but in American history there's this company called Standard Oil yeah I've been hearing and, about Standard Oil a lot the last few days yeah which uh, Standard Oil was at one point the largest oil producer in America, Be and uh, they were quite literally the only oil producer in America, and they got broke up into lots of little tiny companies that you might have heard of nowadays, and that was like through what? the Sherman. Uh, so Chevron, uh, BP, Shell. Uh, Sitgo, and I think there's like a whole bunch of others that uh, I can't, that don't immediately cross my mind right now. I know that Valvoline came later. They're they're not branched off of uh, Standard. BP is from Standard Oil. Yeah, isn't that like British thing? BP. Yep, <laughs> it is. Think. Interesting. I know I, I, of BP, I, I be... but it's not a, it's not not because of a good thing. Uh, at least, if I remember right, that a lot a large portion of uh, their company uh, started from from the Standard Oil split, and I think uh, and I think the uh, guys behind BP actually bought uh, portions of Standard Oil that that were forced to sale. So, uh, Big Pot, I have a question for you. Yeah. Assuming that a very similar thing happens to Google, how long do you think YouTube can stand on its own? Potentially, in a extremely good case, maybe six months. That is pretty... Uh, pretty generous pretty generous but uh yeah 
I have a more conservative answer to that one. I think YouTube might just get a large enough pot of money that they can run for a couple of years. Honestly. At the most. At the absolute most. If you ask me, based on everything I do know about the business of hosting and and displaying videos, like the, the, the realistic answer, not the generous one, is less than a month. Unless yeah. they can actually somehow get huge amount of money. And the pro- bigger problem isn't actually money. It's data centric. It's actual hosting capacity, actual storage capacity, actual compute capacity. Uh, yeah, because if YouTube decides to go separate, I don't know how many dedicated dedicated data centers are specific to YouTube. It might just all be Google probably Cloud. Probably, like, it's, pro- it's yeah. all probably Google Cloud. M- maybe storage is separate. That yeah, I would maybe. guess is separate. But everything else is probably some sort of Google service or just part of actual Google data center because that makes sense. Yeah, and uh, as somebody that makes use of of these computer VPS systems or these cloud providers, uh, I have noticed that the Hardworks uh, GPU accelerated uh, uh, machines are awful pricey. Yeah, they're now, extremely expensive because you have to have GPU, and GPUs are a hot commodity in clouds. And guess what? Why not? Why not? You have to pay a lot of money. Yeah. But uh, I I do know that uh, last I heard, YouTube actually was profitable. Uh, I don't know. Profitable? But... Depending on how you, say, how you think about profitable. Yeah. Honestly, that d- I that question that statement if you completely separate... Uh, YouTube earnings from AdSense earnings, I question that. If you count the AdSense earnings in that come specifically from YouTube into YouTube, I would say yes, because that makes sense, because there is a lot of AdSense. But if that AdSense is under AdSense brand, that earnings are under AdSense brand, and the Ads branch, yeah, no chance, because YouTube premium is, yeah, it's pricey, but also gives a lot of money to creators. So that's why I don't think it's actually creating this money. Maybe movies are creating a bit of money, but even that, a lot of it probably goes for, forward from YouTube to, I don't know, Lionsgate and stuff and companies like that. Uh, I would think that the YouTube premium subscription also brings in a, a rather sizable portion as well. Yes, but uh, YouTube premium subscription means no ads, first of all. Yeah. Second of all, from that pot... Think about uh, three, uh, half of it goes directly to the creator, to the creators. Uh, you should understand that uh, the YouTube Premium, as a as a thing, generates more revenue to the creators you you view than AdSense. So, in past, it was sometimes even two, three times larger the amount of money. For same watch time. Yeah. So, how much of those, I don't know, 7, 15, depending on where in the world you are, euros, dollars, do, does Google actually get on their, uh, th- that is like completely their money? Yeah, that Especially is, that on is the 7 point. euros, like, like Europe pays. Or like at least I, how much I pay in Europe. Yeah, and that is a good point because uh, when when we're looking at like uh, competitors for YouTube, uh, first of all, for like the scope of the content that YouTube is being uploaded, I'm not talking about like the bulk amount, but like the kind of content that YouTube is known for yeah. producing. Uh, what? Well, their competition is TikTok, which yeah, honestly, different not, type of content. Yeah, di- different type of content, but uh, they call that a competitor. Uh, 
Yeah. Uh, I'm going to say that uh, there is no competition for like the 15 to 20 minute video that YouTube is no is famous for. There is there are some yeah, like Daily there are Motion, some. Vimeo, but none of those are actually in the same league as YouTube. Yeah, they are not in the same league, and a lot of times they are not free. Yeah. N- but, uh, and also when we're talking about like quality as well, because if the YouTube video player, for example, I still think is actually one of the best video players that you can access through a web browser. Yeah. Uh, the the only close the only competitor to that statement is actually Float Plates from the uh, Linus Media Group. Yeah. That one's also really good. But but they aren't the competitive to YouTube. They say they, themselves they, they, they are, are not, not. The competitive because they they are basically they are more a Patreon competitor than YouTube competitor. Honestly. Yeah. Uh. And then I think that uh, if people stop, if uh, something happens to YouTube and YouTube can no longer continue as a service, uh, the only, the next one that's coming up would probably be Twitch, which Twitch, Twitch's uh, video on demand system is actually terrible. Yeah. So then it, who's next? Is it Facebook? Th- does Facebook become a video content producer? Because... Meta in pe- all their platforms, possibly, but who else yeah, is n- there? And the reason why I'm the reason why I'm speculating on this is because uh, people aren't going to go to a brand new platform. Yeah, they're going to go to one that already exists. Yeah, but what else is there? Like, I'm thinking: Does Microsoft have a competitor? No. No, does. Microsoft doesn't. Amazon doesn't. Well, besides Twitch, but yeah, we've but already Twitch, established that Twitch, Twitch really is isn't a competitor. Twitch is comparable to YouTube streaming, but not to YouTube uh, yeah. on demand. Uh, what else? The Netflix is not in that game. Nope, Netflix is not. So then, it's got to be Daily Motion, right? Yeah, or or Meta. Yeah, it's either uh, Daily Motion or Meta. So, uh. Unless some. Uh, only option I see is if company like Microsoft came out with YouTube alternative. I would see people going to that if they, if they could somehow get YouTube, or like YouTube videos to be on this new platform. I would see them, the people switching in bulk. To some new platform, but then, but I'm saying that kind of platform would only be able to be run by company like Microsoft, company like Amazon, are the two of the companies that, that don't have a competitor, or more likely a consortium of of many of these companies, which is honestly only where I see YouTube being saved if if it has to be pulled away from Google. If some either some other company bought it, or if there is a consortium of these companies that pull pull the resources together to maintain that kind of resource that is YouTube. So uh, when it comes down to uh, comp- competition for uh, YouTube as it exists, it just basically doesn't exist, and uh, yeah, we're they're basically screwed. Yeah, there there's not a whole lot of. Uh, Good, good side out there. So I guess it maybe it's time that uh, people actually start taking PeerTube seriously. I don't see I don't see distributed video sharing actually working in the long term. I yeah. don't see it working. Yeah, it's okay in short term or for for specific creators, but not on the long term. Not on people actually wanted to use because I don't know they were talking about distributed sharing, which essentially means peop- other people's bandwidth, other people's computers, and more importantly, we're talking about relying on hundreds of thousands of other people's storage, other people's compute, and, well, essentially, at one point, 
Now it's cute. People want to do it because helping out the community. But once everyone is on it, I will wa people will want something in return. I foresee that to be a problem. People wanting something in return. Of course. Of course, uh, and... it also just crossed my mind that Odyssey exists. Yeah, but that has the same yeah. problem. And Odyssey, yeah. that thing is not a... That thing, is, that thing isn't a competitor to, to self, much as to anything else. Well, Odyssey is also uh, making use of uh, the library protocol, which uh, yeah. the library, the company behind that protocol, has been in some uh, Hot shady water. crypto nonsense that they're currently getting sued by the SEC for. Yeah. So, uh, and that that's yeah. the that's the that's the only way I see distributed things happen is with crypto and anything that is connected to crypto is automatically in shady waters if you ask me yeah it's automatically put in the shady waters which honestly at this point i think that uh i think i'm going to set up like uh for, for my own content i'm probably going to be setting up like the like a peer tube mirroring a little bit more aggressively yeah. and actually care about that, what's going on in that platform yeah but now we can start talking about actual costs of coasting. And that's when reality sinks in for yeah. most people. How expensive yeah. this is. So all the time, like I watch uh, Van show from Line of Tech Tips channel. And, and, they, and, and they talk about it every now and then. Whenever they talk about float and I have a cost of... I talk about cost of YouTube. They eventually bring out float because... They actually have experience with it because of that. Yep. And costs are astronomical, especially if you're trying to have delivery or any kind of CDN's level stage because I don't know the day, <clears throat> that's what YouTube has. YouTube has a... Pre Most videos can be easily accessed from anywhere in the world at a, this kind of latency. Instant yep. latency. That is what is impressive and extremely hard for anybody else to do unless they have a huge amount of resources or people give them edge notes for free now uh it's not just networking that we're talking about here too because it's storage, youtube it's compute yeah it's storage and then here's where the real meat and potatoes come from when it, when it caught comes to cost transcoding yes because it's well, it's not it's not <clears throat> hard to set up a javascript based video player that plays a file on a server but what's hard is dynamically detecting the the uh, bandwidth yep. that's used to play that video and transcoding that video down to a uh, to a bitrate that the that, computer, state, that, that, that connection enormous. can handle so now So essentially, I, when you upload a YouTube video, let's take a, take a, let's say I'm gonna use as a unit of measurement, take an episode of No Tax Allowed. That episode is uploaded every week. Upload on my internet connection takes about six, ten minutes at most. And when I upload it, it goes into what is called a queue. You know what a queue is? In in a line of people, first. First in, first out. And each... And that, that clip goes in actually three queues. A 4K queue, a 1080p queue, yeah, and a uh, below... 480 and below. There are three qualities. Uh, standard definition, high definition, and 4K. In reality... It goes actually, standard definition means going three qualities. A uh, high quality means 1080p and 720p. And a 4K means either, means at least 4K, if not also 8K, with the fact that we also in the between of that have 1440p, which I don't know in which category would it be. Plus, now they actually transcode the 4K into two versions. 
low bitrate and high bitrate. That and they're also uh, transcoding into multiple codecs as well. Yes, because you need to do that for uh, speed and comp compatibility. So speed, speed and compatibility, because you know not everybody is using a system that that functions with the VP9 or the AV1 yeah. or even the MP4 codec. And that that first of all brings huge storage costs. You have now you have what 15, 20, 30 versions of a VDA. Even if a VDA is let's say for us that's gonna be the car what uh only four hundred. Let's see. Let me actually look up the actual numbers because I, I have I have I VDAs right know. here. I can look up the actual what we output. Uh, the video would be the MP4. So we're talking about actual output is uh, 5.8 gigabytes for any. Uh, let's let's take a look at episode 19. What came before this one? I think that would be 5.58 gigabytes for an MP4 file. Yes, that this gets transcoded quite heavily down. So we're talking maybe tenth of that. But that's thirty times tenth of that on average. Yep. And we're talking which means we're talking fifteen, sixteen gigabytes of storage. Now just us we produced nineteen episodes up until now, or until till the one that less was edited. And upload it which means it was I upload it on schedule so it should automatically be released when the time is right uh, that means we're talking about let's say 15 gigabytes we're talking 19 episodes 20 that would be uh, 900 285 gigabytes and that's that's a single channel with what is essentially about 20 hours of content. Yep, and uh, to to add on to that, imagine if we were one of those massive channels with all kinds of people wanting to watch those streams. Yes. Now we have to calculate the bandwidth costs. And that's the that's besides compute, that's the second biggest cost factor on internet. Because upload costs a huge amount more than download. We're talking possibly five, ten times more than than same amount of download speed. That's why your residential connection has has uh, five, ten times lower upload speed than download speed. Where download speed you can for fairly cheap get gigabit if you have fiber, while upload speed will still be. 100 megabit 200 megabit that is because the cost of that upload speed is that much more pricey compared to download speed which is also why in cloud download speed is is free by and large and upload speed is then basically by huge amounts of money uh, costing you the download the upload bandwidth that's that's the reason because it's but many times more expensive. Yep. And uh Yeah. I really wouldn't want to uh, host our own platform for Vida, honestly. Nope, and that's why uh we only realistically uh care about the audio podcast. Yeah. So we we just post to YouTube for the visibility. Yeah. And <laughs> even then <laughs> Let's be honest. So, a single episode of the lower quality podcast, which which is what you're probably listening to since it's free, still costs us around. I'm saying cost, but you know what I mean. Like the storage amount is still 32 megabytes for audio version, whereas the high quality audio in mp4 format or mp3 format sorry costs on the order of 100 megabytes so 
from episode 18 forward, each episode's episode costs or takes up 140 megabytes of space. The reason I say costs because I honestly think about storage as a cost component, not as a, not as a something that takes up space. Because honestly, at the end of the day, in any case, for me, storage is more of a function of cost. You just buy more storage. You do. You shouldn't think of it as a uh, function of how much space you're using, because of its. Honestly, low cost at this point. Yep. So, both of us don't think YouTube will fare that well. But there are other services Google could be could be needing to split off if they are forced to split to split things out. Yeah. And uh, have you ever I heard don't of thing? perceive for uh, good things for any of them. Honestly. Yeah. Uh, big pod. Have you ever tried self-hosting email before? Yes, and I gave up real quick. Yeah, uh, because G- Gmail might need to figure out how to how how to self self-host the email here here shortly. Because yeah, uh, I think that they're on the chopping block for sure. Yeah, that thing is basically f- uh, throwing away money for yeah, uh, for individual users. Honestly. We're talking about uh, they, they give about like something like fifteen gigabytes of free storage. It's fifteen it, gigabytes for free storage, which for G for emails, plenty. Yes, like actually plenty, as long as problem, you know you remember once every three and a half years to delete emails. <laughs> problem comes for the security of that email. That's keeping that secure, and when it, when you have probably billions of user accounts even those 50 gigabytes if you have to maintain that storage amount gets huge we're talking about petabytes of storage they would have to if they they aren't over provisioning they would have to keep on the on the clear in their data centers yeah so yeah uh, like uh I I ho- I have my own emails email domain bigpod.fc. I also have my own email domain, but uh, I pay somebody else to handle it for me. <laughs> Same. I don't pay Google, but I pay pay some other big company to handle it for me because at the end of the day, I know I cannot secure the email client correctly or email server. And, and then of course, besides email, there was some. There's some pretty big deals too, uh, like yeah. uh, the the Google Workspaces. So like their their uh, Microsoft Teams alternative. Yeah, uh, that's honestly if if things will be divested or uh, removed or split off, I think Gmail would would go together with Workspaces and all all that shit deck too. So yeah, it, it, it very well Office could be. Suite, uh, communications, Gmail. That would all fall in together into one company, my guess like because it makes sense to, to wanna wanna split it in such a way that those things stay together and but still I'm even then yeah it makes sense for uh only reason it would make sense for to keep Gmail for individuals is just simply being a loss leader. Because yeah. it would bring so much money on the paid side. Because people already use it, they're used to it. So people will naturally gravitate to to the Gmail uh, for business offering. Which is essentially what they're doing now. Yeah, it's essentially what they're doing now. And uh, I know that schools make heavy use of like the Google Workspaces. Uh, I don't even know if that's what they're yeah. calling it. Uh, it could also just be Google Pro. I don't... I don't know what they're calling. Maybe it's Google Workspaces or something like that. Yeah, I'm just gonna call. I'm just gonna call it Google Workspaces, and if somebody has has a correction for that, you can send us an email. <laughs> yeah. But uh, anyways, uh, I have an appreciation of the Google Workspaces because I have used it before, and it's so much nicer than Microsoft Teams, <laughs> uh, or yeah. well, Microsoft Exchange in general. I I just hate that. I don't want it. I don't ever want to touch that again. 
But uh, with with Gmail being separate, I think that uh, with the Google, if Google Workspaces gets separated and Gmail goes with it, I still think that that free free tier can exist for Gmail along with the fifteen gig gigabytes of storage because there's enough of an enterprise market there that or even yeah. just like a enough of a professional market uh there to be able that uh, they could probably keep that running yeah because uh, it would be creating customers yes and and then here's the other elephant in in the room big pod i want to talk about android yeah that one could be yeah. huge it that turns one could be, out that one could be could be problematic like that one in my opinion that one is most likely to to be on question because it is heavily involved in this as a as a thing it's already heavily involved as a unit so how it's more likely it itself would either have to be uh split or some way removed from the search component so that they couldn't couldn't uh, like they would have to work on the same level that, that Google works with external companies. That's that's what would have probably if they're gonna be talking about that kind of uh, punishment. That would be probably the the kind of punishment I would think they would do. Yeah. Now the reason why I'm wanting to talk about Android specifically is because uh, Android is an operating system at its core. Yeah. And a lot of the revenue comes through that Google Play API. Yeah. Now, uh, one way or another, Android is going to exist. It's not yeah. going to fail. There's too much of a market for it to for it to possibly fail. There is no yes. such thing as too big to fail. It's so big that it can't fail. Yeah. That, that's the difference. Now, Android uh, has very much huge amount of buy-in. Now, of course, if the Google, if Android is forced divorced from Google. That automatically means uh, that that uh, they need to spin up a whole new company to manage the Google Play API, which yeah. also means th- those apps, applications that are available. Yeah. Now, uh, and remember, this is, what this is, is the where... default search on Android? No matter what what you open, what's your default default browser? What's your default search on the search bar of the of the Android? What's the default AI assistant. Yeah, Google that Chrome, is, that is... Google Search, and Google Google's AI assistant. Yep. Now, all, all of that uh, would have to be replaced by something else. Possibly, it will it would stay Google Chrome because well, Google Google Chrome is the most popular uh, browser, and it's more likely it would stay. But or same. maybe we can actually see a distributed APK file for Chromium itself. Yeah. But uh, same can be said by Google, Google, Chrome. Google AI now, and Google Search. I, I want to touch on Google Chrome next because I think that's going to be separate from Android. That's uh, going to be a separate not, issue entirely. It, yeah, that's that's a whole separate thing from Android because and, I'm talking about Android, the operating system, and the application yeah. store. If yeah. Android gets divorced, we're... Uh, they they immediately have to uh, cha- change from the Google Play Store to uh, just the they'll probably just do a simple rebrand to, Android to the Android Play Store, a- Android yeah. Store. Uh, they'll probably do that, but my issue is when it comes to moderation. Now, uh, this store is large enough that uh, that uh, there are some sneaky apps to get through. Uh, because yep. Google has never been nearly as restrictive as like Apple has when it co- when it came to it, so uh, we're probably going to start seeing more uh, scam tastic apps be- being put put onto uh, the Play Store. Yeah. So fair warnings for you guys ahead of time that if you're dealing with a mission critical d- critical phone, you might actually be more tempted to buy an iPhone, and I apologize yeah. for you. Or go I, I with feel a sorry device that is that is uh, very much mo- most something like Samsung and just strictly used Samsung related systems. Yeah. Or possibly just go and just load whatever you need and uh, just lock it down completely. Which honestly, you should have been doing today. 
as a best practice. Yeah, anyway. which makes me think. Which makes me think that it it's possible that Samsung's Tizen OS might actually start to see a North American market at Linux, uh, but depending that, on how this works out. That isn't uh, that isn't for for phones really. It's not that's, really for phones, but it, but that was never there, made for phones. I believe there was like one or two phone releases, but it never really got. It was. It is mostly used on, or was mostly it, used on TVs. It, it was and... used on the t- TVs, and I think it's. I think the base layers for it are also used for like their watch. Yeah, but even now, that, I believe it's now Android Wear and Android TV, respectively. And cat, cat, stay down there, please. Thank you. I, I, know, I know. I know. Only reason I know of Tyson. Is because um, for b- big part of Tyson, the user layer is C sharp. That's why I know of it. Never seen it, never used it. Just know of it because of C sharp related relatedness. Of course, uh, we all know that the biggest winner in like uh, the uh, this Android split is going to be Apple. Uh, uh, because I don't know. I I, don't I know. think so. I I, um, I legitimately think so. Honestly, I don't think so because uh, they don't make a phone that would be actually what people would want to buy. Bill that people would care at the. We're not talking about a market of uh, people who spent one thousand dollars. Those people will will have an alter- will have a Android alternative already. Those, Samsung will still make a phone. We're talking about people who pay 200, 300, 400 euros, dollars for a phone every four or five years. Those people won't be buying a 12, 1500 dollar iPhone. That's just not going to happen. I mean, the the other alternative is uh, these Kai, these, uh, Kai OS devices. I don't know if you've seen those. Uh, no. No, now, but... uh, what Kaios is is Kaio Kaios is modern day Firefox OS, which mm-hmm. was a project that Mozilla launched way back in the olden days of pre two thousand fourteen, uh, where they, they where they wanted to come up with like these l- super low end phone devices for the next for the for the next uh, digital economy of Africa yeah. and uh, re- remote regions like that. Well, uh, ultimately, because it's Mozilla, they never really uh, got too big in that. But uh, TCL purchased Firefox OS from Mozilla to and uh, rebranded it to KaiOS, which KaiOS at this point is mostly a feature phone operating system. You know, like the old T9 texting, old-fashioned phones, the, the flip phones. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if uh, you younger members of our audience know what the heck I'm talking about, but if, if you've seen like the cell phones on the Matrix, that's what that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> uh, problem for that I see is basically it is far more likely that Samsung, Sony, uh, what else is like the big, big right now, uh, Nokia or, or HMD Global, whatever it's called. And companies that right now run Android, Android, are more likely to just pour money into a consortium of com- consortium that would take Android and continue it. Why do yep. you say that? Because they already have all the tooling. It would cost too much money to build a new operating, especially not, especially for phones of costs of what what you and I might buy, or especially me nowadays, the phone of 500, 600, 1,000 euro dollar costs, the flagships as they're called. Those phones are the ones that are more like, are, are the ones that we need to worry about because those make, those are the expensive ones, those, with those they want the best experience. But they're also the flag bearers of what is happening lower in in the price stack. Yep. So if those aren't gonna go off Android because they won't at least 
for years afterwards because they won't want to push a bad solution for their honestly most highest paying customers because what they're gonna take their phones they're gonna chuck them into the, the wall and go to the apple that's the problem for them if they go for the for anything else because honestly what operating system that can surpass or can compete with android and ios today nothing unless microsoft again makes windows mobile i would i would guess the, that there is an alternative and honestly at this point all it needs is just a bunch of investment behind it you ready for this yeah Linux. yes but no Technically yes but no but hang on let me sell you on this big pot let me attempt to sell you on this first of all there is a completely working stack for 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 modern phones you you can get your sms your mms you uh there are they're having battery life improvements up the wazoo i have yes. a pine phone that has a 2500 milliamp <clears throat> battery which in, in regards to these days not very big that at this point gets better battery better battery life than the Galaxy S3 that I bought yes. way back in the day. But it, remember, it's the exact same battery. I'm not I'm not thinking about it. I'm thinking again they're gonna have to rewrite the whole of their UIs, the whole of their software logic. They have to change to the utmost degree to get on Linux. Second problem. Linux in its all of its greatness, still hasn't solved the most basic problems Android solved. Permissions and distribution of software. Two problems I want solved tomorrow, if not yesterday. Well, it, 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 there are proposed solutions. There are yes, alternatives. But there are none placed. of them are actually any kind of useful. Remember, we still we still are co complaining or we're still uh, debating whether we should keep traditional packaging method methods alive beyond composition of the operating system, and we're still railing against useful software distribution methods like Flatpak. There's well, you that. know, if flat if Flatpak ran with an open sandbox, it wouldn't be uh, it, it wouldn't be such an issue outside of you know the occasional security concern, which just goes by by the wayside. But the same problem was already solved on Android. That's what I'm trying to tell you. This would yep. This is exactly what they would basically go. Can you do that for us? The answer is no. We don't have a data permission system or a permission system. We don't have a working in combination with a working sandbox that is seamless. Neither of those we have, which means, yeah, we're not a good alternative because they would need to de develop that kind of a stack. Or pour a lot of money into flatback and portals. Which I hope that they do. I hope also they do. Also, the third thing, we're still complaining about basic things like audio servers like display servers and for the most part on a display server side we're running the insecure mess from 30 almost 40 years ago the thing that still has the code in it to run on a physical teletype hey that's Please. pretty cool yes it's that, cool that's pretty cool but at the same time, we're trying to stick that thing onto a phone. Well, I think most of the phone operating systems at this point have moved moved to exclusively using Wayland. I yeah, because uh, I know Thankfully. that they, I know that no gnome for phones is Wayland only. Yeah, and I know that even the most stripped down versions of of uh, the graphical interface of SXMO, I think it, it it's called. 
Uh, they, they've switched off of i3 to Sway as a base compositor. Which is basically just Wayland. And KDE Mobile, I don't believe is X11 either. Yeah. The, the problem, another problem I foresee, like, this is all okay. That does not solve our problems. We have no unified SDK. Which all of that could, like, integration into all of that. Like, if you look at the Android SDK, it's all software, and, it, and let's remember, Android is Linux. So it is possible to solve that problem for us. We're just pushing into the wrong sides of the issue. Like, we're not now, working together on actual s solutions. We're just yelling at each other for there is no solution. Now, uh, for the uninitiated, Big Pod, can you explain in, in the most top-level fashion what an SDK is? SDK or a software development kit is essentially a set of, set of uh, libraries or set of uh, modules that you can use to hook it to different parts of, whether it be a piece of software or in this case, an operating system. It allows for you to build... Uh, uh, Android SDK goes all the way. It's basically end or be all of building for Android. It gives you access to basic components for UI. It gives you access to, to basically every, com any, every accessible component of your, of your operating system on Android. It gives you access to uh, permission systems to ask for right permission and everything on around Android you're doing. Like notification. That's an SDK thing. Wanna put a... I don't know. Wanna... Uh, wanna... Make a widget. SDK. Wanna... Wanna create... Wanna access media and... Stuff like that. So, so you appear like... On your... Like together with YouTube. Or your music player. To do that. That's again SDK. Everything is that Android SDK. And we have many bits and pieces. Problem is there is no unification there. Like we have for UI we have GTK and QT. Both of those are problematic in its own right. For teaming, which is also can be part of an S can be controlled by SDK. Guess what? It's a mess. Now a lot of this uh, a, a lot of a lot of this can be boiled down to uh, we don't have a we don't have a standardized toolkit for example. Uh, we don't we're have still a standardized debating, anything. Yeah, we're, we're we're still we're still in arguments with between GTK and QT, and now there's a new kit on the block called yeah. the the Ice Toolkit. Uh, that's that's going to be something interesting to come come up here with with the next minute. Uh, if we're talking about like you know accessing the sound devices. Are we talking PipeWire? Are we talking Pulse Audio? Hopefully, it's PipeWire. But hey, uh, that that's we're talking still has even to be we're determined. talking on a higher level here. We're talking uh, how to hook into that without having to understand basic primitives of PipeWire. You just write b bits of code that allow you to hook into that without understanding really how you have to write this primitive, this primitive. That's what SDK does for you. It makes things a lot easier, but also, it allows you to access those primitives. Problem I see is like a lot of things are still you hook, you hook into primitives, which then are then handled very differently by different uh, different uh, frameworks, different desktop environments. All of that is a big problem. Like, for example, to get easy access to portals, you have to either use Qt or K or or GTK. And all of that relies on DBus, which in itself is an IPC protocol that is oh, questionable at best. So, a lot of things would need to change before uh, Linux would, have beca would become a viable platform for someone like Samsung to reliably put their S S twenty six Ultra or whatever on, or S twenty eight or or even their 
they don't know what they call the uh, the fold or whatever. There yeah. are three thousand euro phone onto the onto the Linux stack. And, and then, uh, of course, comes the part of securing the system. Whereas, come on, we really don't have much on that part. Whether it be network security, we're really bare on that. You have to do a lot of work yourself, so that we have to figure it out in major way and set it up for you. And like uh, easy and simple encryption and full full disk encryption. Uh, login because you don't you can't you cannot just have a username and password and then of course let's remember we need to have a robust uh, immutable system and a robust uh, non uh, disablement of root and root functions because that's there is a reason Android uh, Android requires rooting for you to access root functions it's security and all that and of course i am saying immutability yes and yes that is partially a solved problem but is it really it like uh is silver blue really the best best use case for that it are there is there actually a better it is like a, what is it? Vanilla OS's approach better, where they just have like the AB root file system. Honestly, is OpenSUSE's micro OS a, a better alternative? Honestly, in this case, based on their their uh, already their pre pre built knowledge, I would say they would more likely go for the model of uh, Vanilla OS because Android uses AB root. Yep. But I do think that Silver Blue's model might work for certain providers. But it would need to be a lot more locked down than Silver Blue is now. But yeah. I don't think Micro S model works at all for anyone. Even for uh, them, to be honest. Of course, there's going to be somebody out there that's going to want to want to show Nix on us, and uh, th that's not how Nix is supposed to work. Sorry. Guys. And no, that's uh, not that... Nix isn't for that. Uh, yeah. Forget Nix. Nix isn't no nope. isn't here in the question at all. The only immutable part about Nix is that you can't write to to anything outside of slash Etsy slash uh, Nix. Technically, so, uh, that is even... immutable. Immutable part. Technically, that is the immutable part. But yeah, technic it's technically immutable. No, it does actually mean it's immutable because, like, the, the file, the root file system, or for most part, root file system cannot be written. That's what immutable means. Problem is with Nix that it is so much dependent on the darn freaking configuration. You really cannot do image based things. Sub the thing that. Silver Blue is so much known for, which you can also do with Vanilla OS and Micro OS. But the thing that I always keep talking about Silver Blue is the use of images. So you build the image as a unit on a remote system, and you take that unit and you splatter it onto the drive as a whole, not as bits yep. and pieces, which is what Nix was as in a standard Linux distro. We're talking about image as a whole. So basically, when you update, you just basically yank the old image out and just put in its place the new one. That's what they're doing. That's why AB root is used with vanilla. And that's why the Silver Blues model using hard linking with OS3 is used. Of course, uh, we, we've, uh, dis we, we've discussed like uh, the, the future of Android. Uh, now, obviously, there is a, a pseudo-secondary monopoly that uh, is not officially uh, recognized yet, and that is called the browser market. Yes. Uh, uh, if if uh, things are going to be split off with, you know, Android, Google Workspaces, Chrome also has to be divorced from Google. Yeah. It's just a matter of fact. Now, uh, Chrome has a huge user base, and it's not just Chrome yeah. that's using that code. Yeah, uh, but we're that's at the end of the day, that's what we're going to be talking about. Just Google Chrome. 
specifically. Yes. But Google now, Chrome, also Google Chrome has a lot of alternatives, a lot of things that you could use instead of Google Chrome and that are quite used. Microsoft Edge. Yes, it's based on Chromium, but it is an alternative, not actually Google Chrome. You, of course, you have things like Safari, which are exclusive on uh, Apple devices. On Apple devices, you also have something called Arc. I have no idea why people even use that thing. I find it horrendous. Uh, you have the, the mess that is Firefox. You have Vivaldi, Opera, and... But the main three currently are Edge, Chrome, and Firefox. And of course, then of course, Chromium and many, many browser things that come from that. Now, if uh, Google Chrome gets spun off of Google, and uh, that, Chromium that is automatically basi- pulls in Chrome OS, let's remember that. Yep, that's that's basically Chrome OS. Yeah, uh, which uh, is heavily reliant on rest of Google stack, so which that means that would be an interesting proposition. Yeah, which means that Microsoft could uh, potentially have to uh, help another help uh, buy it pay for another uh, competitor. That way, you know, Microsoft can continue to have competition. Yeah, but Microsoft has competition. Like, Microsoft, in the OS market, yes, they are. But they're not there because of some problems, at least that we know of. They're there because of external factors that push Windows. Honestly, yeah. way too much. We need to we need to put Windows out of school. But Let's wrap this topic up because we've been going very for a very long time, going on tangents, which might get cut out if we're honest. Yeah, some of them. Yeah, the, there's going to be some trimming done here. Yeah. But uh, so, uh, Big Pod, uh, you you've uh, been paying more attention to this than I have because uh, w- I I discussed it once because you know I was I was just uh, kind of excited to see that hey uh, we get to we get to feel sorry for Microsoft Bros for once. <laughs> Well, uh, CrowdStrike came out, and they published a, a post-disaster report for us. Essentially, uh, yeah, it's a root cause analysis. External technical root cause analysis, channel file 291. It's essentially a document which describes what happened and what sort of mitigations they're going to apply. And it's generally... Uh, Something like this is good to have the root cause analysis, but but honestly, I'm not not a fan of this root cause analysis. At first, they say they're gonna they're gonna be keeping language fairly uh, non terminology field, so they're gonna generalize terminology to to improve readability. But as soon as next section starts, it's filled with techno jargon. <laughs> they tried. <laughs> they do really try it. But the main takeaway, and this section here is my opinion based on what I read because there are things even I don't understand, mainly because I don't haven't read them enough. But this is based on my understanding of this. They had tests, so I was wrong the last time we were reporting on CrowdStrike. They had tests. They just weren't applied correctly. From what I understand, they were, they were doing what is in professional world called unit testing. Essentially, they, they created a test where the file is correct, but they didn't actually apply it, uh, they didn't test the actual file. They tested a pre-created file that was test data, essentially. Not the actual file, but test data. Also, they haven't t- they didn't test it in an actual environment, but they used regex. So all of you who know regex know that regex is a root of all evil. And I'm not joking. There is literally a, a website on internet leg- regex licensing, which says that regex, uh, if you're gonna use regex, you need a license. 
And those companies who actually get a license know they shouldn't be using it. People are actually very much against regex, and I actually have to agree. It's confusing and quickly goes problematic. But they were using a regex that were checking for enough things. And as far as I read, they actually haven't actually tested that file through the regex, but they tested the test file, the template essentially. The most correct file that was granted, but the, this one wasn't generated correctly. Now, there are many, there are basically things. These channel files are essentially files about viruses or about models that used to find new viruses. But they find, found that they weren't validating things correctly. So, uh, number one finding they, they had was number uh, the, the number of fields in the what is called an IPC template, which is IPC template type, which is the template type that was at fault here, the channel file 291, which is actually IPC template type file, was not validated at sensor compile time, which means essentially they had an array of 21, 21 fields in that file, but at some point they were checking only for 20 different outputs, and they were checking if 21st was correct. The 21st was a thing, but then later on, from what I understand, they basically went and exited the 31st, and that's what that's when the whole whole thing bro broke loose. And their mitigation validate the number of inputs. Great. Actually a good 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 mitigation, but that should have been there. That's a best practice. Come on, especially on a kernel level software. A uh, second one is a runtime array bounds check, which was missing for content interpreter input field on channel file 291, which is basically, basically exactly the same thing as before. They should have done it on, before we were talking about compile time, this time we're talking about runtime. Come on, checks. There need to be checks. Like, so is, is something here? Yes, then go check, go do it. So uh, basically, what what you're saying is all they had to do to prevent this to happen was to have a random computer that they would just push into the update to first and just see if it boots. We still haven't gotten to there. What this oh, one means okay. is that what they need in their code is essentially an if statement. If if is this value in the array any value? Then go and go and run this value. Essentially, that's what they needed to do. Or essentially, the check was: is it not null? Essentially, and their mitigation at runtime input array bound checks: is there enough values in the array? Good job. That should have been there already. And. And also to correct the number of inputs in the code and inside the template. Good job. Template testing should cover a wider variety of matching criteria. Okay, but it's still unit testing. Come on. Yep. Their mitigation increased test coverage. It's still unit testing. It's not integration testing. I personally, this is my own opinion, I don't care for unit testing. Unit testing means nothing. It's it's using mock servers, mock systems. That means nothing to me. Deploy the whole environment and run the check on that. Let's see what happens. That's where most problems happen. Now, the, their number four is the content validator contained a logic error. The code was broken, essentially. The validator that had uh, the, that validated if the content of the file is correct, whether it be on I uh, believe that's uh, the content validator works on, on the test suite, but I'm not sure. Or is it in the... I'm not sure. This is where I get lost because they have a lot of details and a lot of jargon that you really hard to understand. But essentially, they want they, their mitigation create additional checks in the content validator and prevent the creation of problematic file. Good job. 
template instance validation should expand to include testing within the content interpreter. Yeah, of course, you should do that. Mitigation, update, content configuration test procedure. Yeah, template instances should have stage deployment. And here we are, that you should take the, take the, the Take files. the damn thing, put it on a computer and see if it boots. <laughs> no, take the, t the, the, first push it to 10 computers. If those crash, you should stop. Then push it to 10,000 if it goes, and then go all forward from that. Their mitigations, uh, content configuration system has been updated with additional deployment layers, acceptance checks, essentially that, and to provide customers control over the deployment of such content updates. Of course, I should have, uh, as administrator, should have the ability to set how quickly I want to get new definitions, new files. Yes, you're, you're gonna get less security, but at least, at least you won't, you have less chance to have your system crashed by an, well, bad file. So, those are their mitigations. So we're still, we're still not doing integrated testing. There is still no integration testing or integrated test environment. As what well, YouTuber said, all they needed to do was put a computer with this update. That's all you had to do to see there was a problem. Right? Yeah. In my opinion, that's the primary thing you should do is integration test. So at this point, uh, they also have a, basically they, they need a third party review. So independent third parties, uh, two different uh, software security vendors to conduct further review of fault and sensor code for both security and quality assurance and both vendors have started reviews with immediate focus on impacted code. So now, now let's go to technical details so I can explain some things. The content interpreter, thankfully I found it now what that is. Part of sensor C++ code, which can test input strings against regexes. Oh no, it's regex in the actual sensor. Which, I guess, means inside kernel. Regex in kernel. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. Sounds like a disaster. <laughs> That's a disaster, yes. Then you have template types, which are contain, which contain predefined fields for threat detection engineers to leverage in rapid response content, which is essentially what this file was a template type of, of a template type template type definition file which is exactly what that this is is define the parameters of each template type definition in this file include information about channel file oh so about which channel file will deliver the content so not actually this is not actually what this is yay how many inputs the template type is meant to use and what kind of data is required for each input uh, you can see how much, how complex their root code analysis document is. Then you have sensor content, which determines how to combine security relevant data with uh, rapid response content in order to make certain de detection decisions. Sensor content includes sensor on sensor AI and machine learning models. So AI machine learning in kernel, as well as template types. It is compiled as part of sensor release. Okay, so this means it is actually VHQL certified. So this is not a problem. Template instance, matching criteria developed by detection engineers. Template instance consists of regex content intended for use with specific template type. Template, template instances identify specific data for use in security operations. Template instances are defined using a UI driven by the template type definition file. Wow. A UI for regex. Yes, it's regex. It's trash. Of course, you need a UI for it. 
<laughs> and then we come to a rapid response content consists of multiple template instances bundled together. A rapid response content is delivered by channel file. And this is what channel file 291 was. Finally came to the conclusion. It was a rapid response content. Then we have content validator. Check the to check the validity of channel files against the definitions in template type definition file. Another thing that didn't work. Or it did work, but wrong, worked incorrectly. Content configuration system used to create templates, which are validated and deployed to the center through a mechanism called channel files. So, yay! <laughs> now, they, they, they also go into why they're using kernel driver in a security product. Essentially, I want to explain why. Because they need to see everything, how files are moving, how, how, what things are loading, what processes are being run, and the best way to see this is to, through a through a kernel driver because it's the lowest on the stack. It runs before anything else, so anything that is higher than it will get actually be seen by it. Now. They also did a crash dump analysis, but I won't go into it because it's more of a visual art, but essentially it's a whole lot of Windows kernel crash dump. And it basically tell that it's it's found the the agent, so the the driver to be at fault and so on and so on. And they also have some additional resources which honestly aren't that imp uh, important for us. As there is some like remediation guidance and t some technical details on Falcon content update, but that is even more filled with technical jargon. It's even less useful than this, which is generalized technical speak. And well, they they they, they knew that the uh, normies were going to be reading this one, so they yes. wanted to, they wanted to do their best. Uh, yeah, they, they, they did their best. Yeah, but, uh, and, and if even for me it was a, a bit too too technical, honestly. Yeah. Probably if I took more time, I would be able to get it. Yeah, it took more time me. to more time to read it, uh, more time to read those definitions, more time to uh, basically read all the links that that they have at the bottom of that PDF, of which we also have linked in the show notes for this episode, <laughs> uh, as well as the judges' ruling concerning uh, Google, because uh, both of them are pretty interesting reads. And uh, I don't recommend that you read the Google one, but you know the CrowdStrike one is only twelve pages, so might as well yep. at least a attempt to read it and form your own opinion of it. Yep. And uh, one way or another, uh, CrowdStrike is probably going to continue as a company, and uh, yep. they're they're probably going to get a market hit, and uh, we're going to see some competition, maybe some McAfee in the future. Uh, they, uh, from what I understand, they're actually pretty good at the the research side, so we'll see how if that continues in that way, but they could get hit with lawsuits. Yeah, uh, and hopefully uh, we get something other than, you know, a $10 Starbucks gift card <laughs> from CrowdStrike. <laughs> it wasn't it Uber Eats? I, yeah, I think it was Uber Eats, of which, uh, by the way, it turns out that, it turns out that there's a uh, small company in my area that got affected by this. And they got the Uber Eats gift card, but it turns out that Uber Eats is not available in my area. <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow. Yeah, uh, welcome to the cornfields. <laughs> but anyways, guys, that's going to be it for the show. Uh, but of course, uh, if you enjoyed hearing Big Pod tell me... Uh, teach me how how to understand this CrowdStrike document and our discussion on Google, which you know is probably a little carved up here. Uh, I do highly recommend that you go to this fancy new uh thing that we have. It is a patreon.com slash no tux allowed. Hopefully, it's in big giant text going across the screen right here, probably right above my head. Yeah, we'll see. Probably, we'll see where where I where I stick it and how I stick it. Yeah, if you're if you're watching the video, maybe maybe it'll spin. Have some glowing effects? Can no. we 3D animate it? <laughs> Not gonna go that far. But uh, okay, well, I do recommend that the you... The actual link is in the description and show notes. 
So you can click on it instead of retyping it. But I want them to type it. Don't you know that there's a downfall in the quality of people's typing in, in the past 10 years? We need yes. to fix this. We need to we need to fix people's spelling. We're on the internet. But anyways, mm-hmm. guys, uh, just to let you know, uh, this is a self-hosted podcast. And while it is affordable, it is not free. Yeah. And so if you if you if you find value in this production, go go to that link and drop and give us a couple of dollars. And for giving us that, you're gonna get access to a completely uh, new podcast called NTA Premium, which is essentially higher quality content of this podcast. Yes, higher quality. Higher quality audio. Yeah. Uh, for now, uh, of course, if we think of like uh, more cooler things that we can put on there, we probably will in the future. Yeah. But hey, uh, be a bro. Drop us a couple dollars. Uh, in the meantime, if you, if you have feedback about this episode too, we have the universal contact link of contact at tuckspace dot com, also showing up in big giant text, hopefully somewhere on the screen. Yes. Or if you need to shout at us directly, and you're on a federated platform. You can go to these links here, and hopefully Big Pods actually works to this week. Uh, hopefully. Hopefully. As in right now, as of this recording, it's still not working. But hey, you can shout at me. <laughs> I've been on vacation. Yep. Anyways, guys, that's it for us today. We'll see you next week. Goodbye. <laughs>